Ne tamma tamma lecende tata hinderes. Okay, so we begin tonight. Geshla is saying, uh, welcoming everyone and giving greetings for everyone attending the class. So last week we completed um, the presentation of the six perfections and the four ways of gathering disciples, which fall into the training of the individual of the great scope. All right, so if you remember, when we were looking at the proper way to progress along the path, we say that the first thing that we have to do is to become disappointed with cyclic existence and begin looking for liberation. So when you look for a path of liberation, the basic method is to follow the three higher trainings. And when we talked about that from the three higher trainings, we had a presentation of the first one, which was, Uh, the ethics of abandoning the 10 non-virtuous actions and then it said the text said i will not elaborate on the other two because they will be explained later on and so this is what happens later on we have this presentation of the last two perfections in a more elaborate way So if we actually bring into mind the outlines, when we look at the training the mind according to the path of the great vehicle, in this we have two main outlines. The first one is uh, how to generate the mind of bodhicitta and the second one is how to train in the context of the bodhisattvas after you have generated the mind of bodhicitta. So for the first one, the way to generate the mind of bodhicitta, first of all, we have preliminaries and then we have the actual part. In the actual part, we present the two methods, which is the six-fold cause and result method and the seven um, and the method of equalizing and exchanging self for others. So once you have followed either of these methods in order to generate the mind of bodhicitta and you have taken the vows, bodhisattva vows, then the next thing is how do you actually train in the conduct of the bodhisattvas and in that we have the general presentation of how you pra- of how you train and then we have a specific um, presentation of the last two perfections in the general presentation we have the general presentation of the six perfections and the four ways of gathering disciples and then at the end we have a more extensive presentation of the last two perfections this is absolutely important because for anyone who wishes to obtain the state of liberation or the state of omniscience they have to train in the perfections perfection of concentration and the perfection of wisdom. So these uh, last two perfections are very important and this is why we have a more elaborate presentation. No. Okay, so if we go into the easy path in our root text, in my printed version is at the bottom of page 37. It says, as for the second outline, how to train in the two last perfections in particular, it is divided into two how to train in calm abiding, the essence of concentration, and how to train in superior insight, the essence of wisdom. So basically here we have to look at two trainings, training in calm abiding and training in special insight. So the first calm abiding, is the training in calm abiding, a is again split into two how to practice during the formal meditation session and how to practice during the intervals between sessions the first which is how to practice during the formal meditation session consists of preparation the actual practice and the conclusion so you see with all the subjects that we have done in the easy path we have this uh, general common presentation You have the session, you have in-between session, and the session is presented in three parts, the preparation, the actual part, and the conclusion. Okay, the preparation consists of the common preliminaries. So the common preliminaries are the six preliminaries that we have been mentioning at the beginning of every session. And in particular, in training in the contemplations per training to the persons of the small and medium capacity. At the outset, rely on the preconditions for cultivating calm abiding. 
So here we have those preconditions or the prerequisites of establishing calm abiding. And these are very important. There are six of them. The first one is that you have to abide in an appropriate area. The second one, having little desire. The third one, being content. The fourth one, completely give up many activities. The fifth one, have uh, pure ethical discipline. And the sixth one, completely get rid of thoughts of desire. So these are the preliminary, six pre specific preliminaries for calm abiding. Okay, so uh, let's go into our text. It says, at the outset, rely on... Uh, oh, sorry, the preparation consists of the common preliminaries and in particular in training in the contemplations pertaining to the person of small and medium capacity. At the outset, rely on the preconditions for cultivating calm abiding. And then it begins giving the list. Living in an isolated and pleasant place that is healthy and close to good companions. So actually this describes the first one of the six prerequisites, which is the appropriate area. So in the classical text, the appropriate area for doing a calm abiding retreat uh, is said to have five uh, characteristics. The first one, it has to be, uh, it has to have easy access. The second one, should be a good place to live. The third one, good ground. The fourth one, good companionship. And the fifth one, well situated. So the first one, easy access, indicates that the location where you're going to cultivate uh, calm abiding should allow you to have easy access to your necessities. So food and clothes and things like that. If you don't, if you cannot obtain those things easily, it will become an obstacle to your practice. Okay, so if we're looking at the full set of five characteristics for the suitable location, Matryeus ornament of the Mahayana Sutras states, the intelligent practice in a place which is accessible, is a good place to live, offers good ground and good companions, and has the requisites of comfortable yogic practice. Okay, so it says those who are intelligent and are going to cultivate calm abiding will choose a place that has these characteristics. The first one, it says, is accessible. Accessible means it, the location is not too isolated. So that means that it will be easy for you to find whatever provisions you need to sustain you during the retreat. You don't want to be too isolated so that it becomes an obstacle to your practice. The second one, it says it's a good place to live. A good place to live is a place where previous holy beings have done practice there and have blessed the place with their practice and their presence. The next one uh, offers good ground. Good ground here, it means that the ground, the, wa the water, the climate in the area suits your physical constitution. Otherwise, if you go and stay for a long time in an area that doesn't suit you, you will develop illness. All right. The next one is that it offers good companions. Good companions here indicates that the people who will be nearby, perhaps doing similar practices with yourself, should have similar views with yourself. You don't want to be trying to do the retreat amongst people with whom you disagree or you have different views. And the last one, it says it has the requisites for a comfortable yogic practice. And this indicates that the place is not, let's say, inhabited by carnivorous animals like tigers and lions and things like that. There are no enemies, no thieves, and so forth. Okay, so in the ornaments of sutras, the location is said to have those five characteristics. In the easy path, the words that describe the suitable location is living in an isolated and pleasant place that is healthy and close to good companions. Okay, so this expression that we had, that the place should have the requisites for comfortable yogic practice, has another meaning as well. It means that 
whatever you require for your practice, um, it should be at hand. And that means that before you go into retreat, you should have done your preparation in terms of study, go and receive teachings. You understand the instructions, you have the text that you need to reference during your practice and so forth. So whatever you will need for your practice, you must have organized, clarified, removed the doubt, understand the instructions and so forth before you start the practice before you start the retreat so that is a very crucial point okay the next one following the easy path is maintaining pure morality so maintaining pure morality is very important if you are ordained you will have your vows of ordination in addition to that most probably you would be having the bodhisattva vows if you are a lay person, you will have the lay person's um, vows to keep. Uh, the very minimum is to keep the morality of abandoning the 10 non-virtuous actions. So keeping pure morality whilst you do this practice, again, is very important. Okay, the next uh, thing that we have in uh, the easy path is abandon all gross thoughts of desire and wishing for the company of many people. So let's talk about this uh, wishing for the company of many people first. So in the other list, in the prerequisites of calm abiding, it's said to completely give up many activities. So whether you are ordained or whether you are a lay person, when you're doing this type of retreat, you have to cut down on activities. So this idea that you're going to be busy, you're going to be meeting a lot of people, people will be coming to your place or perhaps, you know, asking for more, you will be doing divinations, you will be taking the stars, you will be even practicing medicine, administering, you know, diagnosing people, administering medicine to other people and so forth. All of these activities, you really have to stop. You really have to cut down. Even though there might be, in another context, there might be beneficial activities, in this case, you cut down on these activities. Okay, what came before that in the list is to abandon all gross thoughts of desire. And the way that we do this is to consider all the shortcomings of cyclic existence and see that all those desirable objects actually are become like faults within samsara. So by considering their faults, you cut down on gross desire. Okay, another characteristic of the location where you are doing this retreat that is very important is that the place should be quiet. So you're looking for a location that during the day it does not have the sound of too much human activity, like too much traffic and other human activities. But also in the evening, it should not have the sound of let's say, a waterfall, water moving, and so forth. So being in a quiet place where you don't have much noise is cru crucial for developing this type of concentration. Okay, going back into the list of the six prerequisites, we have, after the appropriate location, right, we have having little desire and being content, number two and number three. So having little desire here, it means that, let's say, whatever clothes, robes, or whatever food you have, whatever bedding you have, you should not be having the desire that, uh, I want to have more, I want to have better quality, this is not sufficient, um, you know, I want to have a variety of food every day and so forth. The next one, which is being content, is having this attitude that says, however much I have and whatever quality it is, that's enough, it will do. Okay, continuing from our text, uh, so we have practice having little desire and being content, and that com completes the list. And then it says, then sit cross-legged on a comfortable cushion, straighten up your body, 
place your hands in the meditation posture, maintain your breathing calm, and so forth. So once you have found the proper place, so as we say, you know, and you have put all the right conditions that are the six prerequisites for developing calm abiding, once you find all of this, all of this is in place, then you take your seat. So the way that you sit is in the posture of um, Buddha Vairochana. So you're sitting cross-legged. Your hands is in the mudra of equipoise. And then it says, um, maintain your breathing in a, in a calm way. So this refers to the nine rounds of breathing. So this concludes here the preparation. And after the preparation, we will have the actual practice. So, as you can see here, we have completed the first part, which is the preparation. We're talking about developing the concentration of karma biting. It is presented in three parts, the preparation, the actual part, and the conclusion. So, in the preparation, it's what we do is, first of all, we do the common pre preliminaries. We train in the subjects of the individuals of the small and the medium capacity. Obviously, we generate the mind of bodhicitta, and then it is important that we put together the six prerequisites that are specific for cultivating karma abiding. And those six is to find an appropriate area, having little desire, being content, completely give up many activities, maintain pure ethical discipline, and completely get rid of thoughts of desire. So once all this preliminaries are in place and you know how to sit properly to maintain the meditation once you finish all this it means you have the first part the preparation complete and then you will start with the actual practice okay so we notice here that it says that in the preliminaries for developing calm abiding you have to train according to the practices of the person of the small and the medium capacity and then obviously in addition to that you have to train in the practices of the person of the great scope uh, this we have to understand that it is not something which is necessary in all occasions Kama abiding and special insight are not unique Buddhist practices. They are practices that you will find also in non-Buddhist practitioners. Actually, there are quite a lot of non-Buddhist practitioners who attain very high levels of karma abiding or very high quality of karma abiding and quite refined in their practice of special insight. Since these practitioners are not Buddhist, obviously they will not be practicing in, they will not be training in the practices of the, that are shared with the individual of the small scope, the middle scope, or the practices of the individual of the great scope. However, here we're following a text that obviously shows how someone who is a Buddhist would train in the three scopes. Right. So taking this as a granted, when we come here to come abiding, it says one of your preliminaries is that you have done all this training. Mm. So let's uh, we're talking about cultivating here the concentration of calm abiding. So let's look at uh, the etymology. What does the term calm abiding indicates? So the first part, the calm, indicates that the mind remains calm remains very focused it means the mind remains within uh, and so you choose a focal object and the mind will stay will remain with it without having the disturbance of constantly being distracted somewhere else so the calmness it means the mind is not distracted and then we have calm and then we have abiding abiding it means it will remain with whatever you choose to be your focal object right so very calmly without being distracted it will remain with that focal object and when we say here it will remain it means it will remain for a very long time we're talking about six hours and so forth without being distracted to another object now, in our current state, all of us, before we obtain karma abiding, we have what is said, what is described as non-pliancy or non-serviceability in terms of the body and the mind. 
So if someone says, okay, choose a focal object and try to focus on this and your mind should not be disturbed from or move away from that focal object. If we try to do this, we cannot even stay with a focal object for one minute. The mind will be rebelling. And that shows that the mind does not have pliancy. The mind is not serviceable. And also, if we try to sit for a long time without moving and so forth, you will notice that the body becomes very uncomfortable, tight, painful, and so forth. So that indicates that we don't have serviceability or pliancy of the body as well. However, when we talk about calm abiding, we are talking about a state where we experience the bliss of physical and mental pliancy and above this bliss or in addition to that bliss, we are capable of maintaining single-pointed concentration upon a single object for however long we wish to remain for th with this object. So you want to meditate on it for five hours, six hours, however long you want to stay with the object, you stay with the object. Okay, so in terms of the type of meditation, calm abiding is said to be a placement meditation. In general, we have a twofold division of meditation. We say we have placement meditation and analytical meditation. So calm abiding is placement meditation, while special insight is analytical meditation. They say that there is incredible benefit that comes from developing calm abiding because the way that you engage your object is, becomes very different. So let's say that you meditate on impermanence or the law of cause and effect or the faults of uh, samsara or love, compassion, bodhicitta and so forth. There's a great difference between the way that you meditate on those things before you obtain calm abiding and after you obtain calm abiding. Because after you obtain calm abiding, whatever of these subjects you choose to meditate upon, the mind will just remain undistracted without diverting to anything else on this object. So your con your meditation is going to be much more effective actually they say that once you develop calm abiding your virtue becomes very strong so for that reason it is said that true qualities really come once you develop calm abiding and special insight Right, so uh, when we say calm abiding and special insight, we have two. We have the actual state of calm abiding and the actual state of special insight. And we have a state that is similar to the actual one, but it's not the actual one. So whether you have the similitude or whether you have the actual states of calm abiding and special insight, this is only, only then you start getting qualities. Okay, so we have explained here the preparation. We say this, uh, how to cultivate calm abiding comes in three, three parts, the preparation, the actual part, the conclusion. We finish the preparation. So we continue now with the actual part. If you look at the root text, as for the actual practice, although many objects of meditation are mentioned for cultivating calm abiding, using the deity's holy body is excellent since it serves many purposes, such as perfecting mindfulness of the Buddha and making the yogi a suitable vessel for the deity yoga of the Mantrayana. Okay, so for the actual practice, we're going to be developing calm abiding. It is concentration. And when you develop concentration, you must have a focal object. The focal object acts as the basis upon which you tie the mind, right? So we need to have a focal object. The Buddha has actually said that there are four different focal objects for developing calm abiding. The first one is what is called the pervasive um, focal object. The second one is focal objects that modify behavior. The third one is the focal object for the scholars. 
And the fourth one is focal object that modify afflictions. Having said that there are four different types of focal objects, it doesn't mean that one individual has to practice all four, right? The individual chooses uh, whichever focal object is more suitable for his or her own mind, his or her practice, right? So in particular here, we see that the text suggests that the focal object is the body of the Buddha. Uh, there are many benefits for that. The, there is the benefit of developing constant recollection of the image or the body of the Buddha. And the other benefit is that it prepares you for deity yoga that you will do later on when you practice Tantra. So from the beginning, if you choose the Buddha's aspect, the body of the Buddha as your focal object, you will already have some advantages in your practice. So we say that we have four different objects of uh, focal objects for developing calm abiding, but we say it's a great, a great benefit if you choose from the beginning to focus on the body of the Buddha from the beginning. So the classical texts, they give a list of benefits, of advantages that choosing such an object will give you. So it says uh, from the beginning, if the yogi focuses on the form of the body of the Tathagata, so the body of the Buddha, they will accumulate a greater merit because they are focusing on this excellent form uh, adorned with uh, marks and signs. They will be able to quickly build up a vast accumulation of merit and proceed with their purification. If you have this constant vivid appearance of the body of the Buddha, it means that you will be readily, you know, you can direct your, pray, your prayers, you can make praise, you can make offerings in front of that very clearly visualized object of the Buddha. Also, this can act as a means for your purification because you can readily offer your confession, do, do prostrations and so forth. So immediately you have this advantage of building up merit and purifying your obscurations and negativity. Also, the other advantage is that if you cultivate calm abiding by focusing on the body of the Buddha, at the time of death, you will not forget that form so it means when you pass away you will pass away with the clear recollection of the body of the buddha and finally it prepares you for tantra because you will be prepared to work with the divine body which is the the essence of deity yoga in tantra so there are all these benefits Okay, so having said that, the best focal object to choose for developing calm abiding is the body of Buddha Shakyamuni. All right, so exactly how are we going to do this visualization? Okay, so um, if we go back into the easy path, um, okay, it says, proceed imagining that from the heart of the Guru Yidam, abiding on the crown of your head, Light is radiated like a spider web thread. Okay, so when we do all this practice in the easy path, we always have the guru in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni at the crown of your head. So it says, from the heart of that guru Shakyamuni that you have on top of your head, imagine that rays of light go out. Now it says here that those rays of light are quite fine and they look like a spider web so it's you know golden light that goes out okay at this extremity meaning at the tip or at the end of these rays of light upon it is a variegated lotus a moon disc and sits buddha shakyamuni and then it says then continue the initial visualization uh, from here until he is sitting in the cross-legged position in a halo of bright light coming from his body. 
All right, so we have our Guru Shakyamuni at the crown of your head. From his heart, rays of light go out. At the tip of the rays of the light, we have a seat of a lotus and a moon seat. And on top of that, we have Buddha Shakyamuni. So this Buddha Shakyamuni emits another Buddha Shakyamuni. So this Buddha Shakyamuni has, you know, we, we have done in the very beginning, we were explaining the six preliminaries. There is the description there of uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, the object of refuge, the main figure of the object of refuge. So he has a golden body, one face and two arms. The arms are in the posture of equipoise with a begging pole on top top of the right hand. Uh, the body is marked with all the marks and the signs. And um, uh, he's sitting in the in a posture of equipoise and cross-legged and he has a halo of light coming from his body. Okay, so that's a basic visualization. Okay. One should meditate focusing on this figure visualized in the space in front of oneself at the navel height. So this Buddha Shakyamuni that we will be focusing upon, the one that is projected, is in front of us. It's not too high. It's not too low. It is at the level of your navel. And as big as a Chinese lentil. So as big as a Chinese lentil, imagine like a pea the size of a pea, right? Um, okay, so this is the um, visualization, the place and the size of the focal object. Okay, um, we say that uh, in the text it says that we can actually have another uh, focal object. So it says, as an alternative, one can imagine that a duplicate, like a spark separating from another spark, is radiated from the Guru Yidam residing at the top of one's head and dissolves into oneself. One should meditate focusing on oneself, visualized as Buddha Shakyamuni, like a rainbow in the sky appearing, although lacking inherent existence, and of a luminous gold hue, and so on, till sitting in the cross-legged position in the hollow of of bright light coming from my body. Okay, so we said that the first way to meditate is to imagine that the, the Guru Shakyamuni that we have at the top of our head uh, projects or sends another Guru Shakyamuni in front of us. The alternative way is to visualize that a replica of Guru Shakyamuni f separates from the one that is at the top of our head and comes and dissolves within ourselves. By this dissolving of Buddha Shakyamuni, we transform into Buddha Shakyamuni. So now you see yourself in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. So all this visualization that we have before, that you have the throne supported by the eight lions, and you have the variegated lotus, then you have the moon seat, and then on top of that, you're like Buddha Shakyamuni, one face, two arms, in the legs, in uh, the full lotus positions, the arms in equipoise, and your body radiating light. So this is how now you can visualize yourself. Uh, and you see that as appearing as a rainbow in the sky without having any solid existence, okay? So basically, we have two options, either Buddha Shakyamuni in front or yourself as Buddha Shakyamuni. So as you can see here, you have a choice and you can choose whichever, wherever you want to place or to visualize Buddha Shakyamuni. Either you place a Buddha Shakyamuni in front of you or you visualize yourself as Buddha Shakyamuni, depending on which one you find more suitable or easier to meditate upon. So obviously here you can see the instructions um, refer to, you know, they indicate that you're familiar with the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. But if you were a total beginner and you didn't really know or you didn't, um, hadn't memorized the detail of the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni, then what you would do, you would take a tanka or you would take a statue of Buddha Shakyamuni with good detail and put it in the space in front of you and look at it repeatedly until you become familiar with the details of the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni.
So once you become familiar, then you, in your mind, you can visualize that image. So it is important here to make the distinction that the external physical tanka or printing or the statue is not your focal object. The focal object for karma abiding can only be a mental object, right? So your sense awareness is supporting you, is helping you until you learn the details, but it's not going to be your focal object. The focal object is what appears in your mind once you have familiarity with the aspect of that form. Okay, so it says here in the easy path, when meditating, if the figure appears as red, although we have decided to be yellow, or if it appears standing, although we wanted to be sitting, or if it appears as many figures, although we wanted to be a single figure, one should not follow these transformations, but rather one should stick to the original figure chosen at the outset and meditate focusing on it. All right. So we say that the focal object is Buddha Shakyamuni, golden in color and sitting in equipoise, right? So it says... You, it is supposed to be, you know, has this uh, very, uh, the yellow, a particular yellow color, which is the color of refined gold. But in your meditation, it appears as red. Or in your mind, you think it's supposed to be yellow, but actually I prefer to visualize it as red. I see some benefit if it is red. Okay. Or it's supposed to be sitting but in your mind, you think, oh, look, it appeared standing. Actually, it's better. I will go with the standing version. Or, you know, we know that we just focus on one Buddha Shakyamuni, but somehow when you sit down to do the meditation, you see many and you think, oh, many is more benefit than one. I'll go with the many. So very clearly, the instruction says, do not follow any of those variations. You have to stick to the original focal object. Basically, if you start changing the original focal object, you will not develop karma biting. So whatever is the focal object, it's supposed to be golden yellow. It's supposed to be sitting. It's just one figure. It just has these specific characteristics. You have to follow that. We we'll continue with the easy path. It says, although the figure does not appear that clearly in the nature of limpid and clear light, one should meditate focusing on the general image of the body, having just some parts of it clear. Okay, so we say the first thing that you do is you don't change um you know, the visualization. It's supposed to be a single Buddha Shakyamuni, golden in color. It's supposed to be sitting in the po in the equipoise. So don't change any of this. But then here we have this instruction that indicates that when you begin doing the practice, the focal object initially does not appear clearly. One of the features is that the focal object should be very clear and radiating light. But it says here, if the figure does not appear that clearly in the nature of limpid and clear light, which indicates initially it might be dull, it might not be radiating color. Uh, it says, nevertheless, one should meditate focusing on the general image of the body, having just some parts of it clear which again indicates that you will not be able to see the entire body, okay? So you might just see kind of like a, a general figure without being able to distinguish the head or the arms or the legs or any other um, specifics of the body in the beginning. So it says you should be, you should accept this. So one of the ways that we work through that is that we begin building up the visualization gradually. First the head, then the arms, then the main trunk of the body, and then finally the legs. And if you do it like this, eventually you will get the whole uh, shape of the body appearing. And when this happens, you have found the focal object and you focus upon it. Okay, then it continues by saying, proceed in this way in your session till this point if no laxity and excitement arises. Where laxity and excitement 
to arise after having immediately recognized it and generated a strong wish to eliminate them, bring your memory back to the object of meditation again and again without forgetting it and focus on it. Sustaining the continuity of this mind is the best method for beginners who wish to cultivate calm abiding. So the advice that we have here for beginners, when you begin the practice, the most important thing is to have that determination. Determination here is that you set, let's say, your limits for this session. So you say, however long this session is going to be, whether it's going to be one minute or two minutes or whether it's going to be half an hour, I am determined that I will not let mental sinking or mental excitation ruin my session. I will be vigilant with introspection and if these things appear and start ruining my session, I will, you know, I will confront them. I will try to stop them. All right. So stopping mental excitation or mental sinking allows you to remain focused on the focal object and then you stretch that continuity you create continuity like i'm able to remain with the object for longer i'm able to remain for longer so you want to um, cultivate that continuity sustain the continuity of this mind is the best method for beginners right so this is what you do you have to be determined that you will have a good quality session and you will maintain continuity mm -hmm. All right, so what have we completed so far? We have explained that we need to have some prerequisites for cultivating calm abiding. Those are the six prerequisites. Second, we have identified the focal object and we said the there are different focal objects, but the best one is to choose the body of a deity. Um, next is having chosen, chosen this focal object, how do we actually focus upon it? So we said that we have two options. Either you visualize Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front or you generate yourself as Buddha Shakyamuni. So you choose which, whichever of these two is most suitable from you. All right. So now when you actually come to the main part of the practice of cultivating calm abiding, you have to be prepared to um, deal with five faults. We need to deal and overcome these five faults by applying antidotes. And those are eight antidotes. In protector materials, differentiation of the middle and the extreme, there is a mention of those five faults and the eight antidotes. Okay, so let's uh, look at those five faults that can arise when we actually try to develop calm abiding. The, um, the verse says laziness, forgetting the advice, mental sinking and mental excitation, not exerting yourself in applying the antidotes when these arise and over applying the antidotes when they are not present. So the first one is laziness. The first of the faults is laziness. The second one is called forgetting the advice. Forgetting the advice actually refers to losing your focal object. Like you forget what the focal object was supposed to be, so you lose it. The third one actually includes two faults, uh, mental sinking and mental excitation. Then the fourth one uh, saying is not applying an antidote. So you know that you have a problem with mental sinking or mental excitation, but you don't do anything to overcome this. And the fifth one is when there is no mental sinking and there is no mental excitation, but for some reason you keep applying antidotes as if they were there, all right? So you are over applying the antidote when it is not needed. So these are the five folds that we need to overcome and we need to apply eight antidotes. Okay, so if we look at our text, it says, in brief, to cultivate a correct concentration, one should do it by way of the eight antidotes, which eliminate the five faults, as it is said in Matryas, distinguishing the middle from the extremes. Calm abiding 
derives from the cause of applying the eight antidotes to the five faults. So at the initial stage, laziness is a fault or an obstacle. Therefore, there are four remedies to that. Faith, which is the good qualities of concentration. Aspiration, which strives for it. Effort, which endeavors to attain it. And pliancy, which is the result of striving. So we see that we have five faults, but the first one that is laziness requires four out of the eight antidotes, right? So it requires quite a lot of effort, basically, to overcome laziness. Okay, so the first one, the first remedy for overcoming laziness is faith. Faith comes from having seen the good qualities that, are de that follow the development of concentration. Once you see the good qualities, we, you will have faith for that concentration. Once you have faith, you will have the aspiration that is striving to achieve that concentration. And if you have that aspiration, you will put the effort which really endeavors to achieve it. And finally, as a result of that, you will have the pliancy, which is the result of striving. Pliancy here is pliancy both in terms of body and mind. So you will be able to remain with that focal object and your mind will be completely at ease, will not be moving away, will not be distracted to any other object, but also your body will be very comfortable and will not feel any tiredness or fatigue. So we see the first fault is laziness and to overcome laziness, we need to have faith by seeing the qualities of concentration, aspiration, wishing to obtain that concentration, effort eh, that strives to achieve it and the result of pliancy that comes from that effort. We come to the second fault. The first one was laziness. The second one was forgetting the instruction. So whilst cultivating concentration, forgetting the instruction is an obstacle. Therefore, mindfulness is the remedy to it. So it says if you forget it, the remedy is to try to remember it. Memory that just let us remember the object of meditation is not sufficient. The mind has to focus on its object vividly and intensely so that an, an ascertained or convinced knowledge of it is induced. So it says, if you're forgetting the instruction, forgetting the focal object, obviously the antidote is to try to remember it. But merely having recollection of what your focal object is supposed to be is not enough. You actually have to engage that focal object tightly, right? So you pay uh, attention to that object vividly and intensely. So Gesher was saying it is similar to the way that you want to hold a cup. So if you're holding a cup, you don't want to hold that cup too loosely right you're still holding it but you're not really holding it you want to hold it tightly in your hand so this is what you have to do with a focal object it's not just that you remember what your focal object is supposed to do but there has to be this tight vivid um, forceful holding of that focal object Okay, we continue with the third fault. The third fault occurs when you actually are cultivating calm abiding. So when you are in this uh, single-pointed equipoise. So this is the time where mental thinking or mental excitation might arise. It says, when absorbed in equipoise, laxity and excitement are obstacles. Therefore, introspection is the remedy to this. Introspection checks carefully whether laxity or excitement have a reason or not. If they have a reason, the highest caliber type of practitioner will recognize them as soon as they start to come up and will be able to eliminate them. The medium type of practitioner will be able to eliminate them 
just after they have occurred. And the inferior type of practitioner will also recognize them after a short while and will be able to eliminate them. So the main problem here uh, that can ruin your concentration is mental sinking or mental excitation. So what you need to have in place is introspection. Introspection is this aspect that is constantly checking like, am I laxing here? Am I overexcited? How is, you know, how, how is my concentration? So we have different levels of practitioners. And it says that the best practitioners have this level of introspection that allows them to detect mental sinking or excitation even before they settle in. So just as they are about to arrive, they have not arisen yet. Right? So just as they come in close, your introspection will give you a warning and you will know that they are coming. So you are prepared. If you are a middle length, middle caliber practitioner, you will recognize them quickly as soon as they arrive. But they have already arrived, right? But as soon as they arrive, you know they're there and then you oppose them. And finally, it says the least capacity practitioner will recognize them soon after they arrive. So ideally, we want to have an introspection that in any case does not allow them to linger for a long time and damage the quality of concentration. Mm. Okay, so... Um, there is a question here. So it says, well, then, what is the difference between lethargy and laxity excitement? So up to here, we're talking about laxity and excitement, mental sinking and mental excitation. Here, it brings another element, which is lethargy. And he says, how are we going to differentiate this? Because when we meditate, we should be able to identify exactly where the mistake is. You know, these are three different states. So we should be able to differentiate them. So first of all, it begins by talking about lethargy. And he says, lethargy is sort of a clouded mental state accompanied by heaviness of body and mind that makes the object of meditation not to be clear. Okay, so lethargy, you could say, is the worst case body and mind are quite heavy and your focal object is not clear, right? So your, your mental state is not bright and clear. Everything is clouded. So this is the case of lethargy. Then it's looking at laxity and makes a distinction between gross laxity and subtle laxity, which is very important. So first of all, gross laxity is a mental state in which, although the mind does not stray away from the object of meditation, it lacks clarity and limpidity, and memory is quite weak. So with gross laxity, you don't have clarity. It is not limpid, and the memory of the focal object is very weak, but you have not lost the object yet you're still remaining with the object. But as you can see here, the quality of the way that you hold the object is very unsatisfying. The next one, subtle laxity, is a mental state in which, although clarity and limpidity are present, the vivid and firm ascertaining consciousness which ascertains the object has slightly weakened. So that is the difference between the gross and the subtle laxity. In subtle laxity, you have great clarity. You have a limpid object. And in terms of ascertaining the object, which means in terms of the way that you're holding the object, you are just a little bit relaxed, just a little bit. You're not as tense, you're not as tight as you should be. So as you can see here, subtle laxity, uh, actually to most of us would appear to be great meditation because you have the clarity, it is clear, you're focused on the object, you know, you're not super tight, you're even a little bit relaxed and so forth. And Lama Tsongkhapa actually, in his words, has taken great effort 
to clarify that this is subtle laxity and subtle laxity is not a good meditation. Prior to Lama Tsongkhapa, a lot of great practitioners made the mistake. They reached this point and they thought that this is calm abiding. They have reached the actual calm abiding. But Lama Tsongkhapa very clearly differentiates and he says, no, although you have clarity, it is limpid, it is clear, you're still holding on the object, it is tight, but it's just a little bit loose. So the tightness, the way that you hold on the object is a bit loose. So there's a great problem with subtle laxity, right? As I say, all of us would consider if we reach that point, we would think that we have a very good meditation. A lot of people have mistaken this for calm abiding. However, it's an obstacle to calm abiding. Okay, so as we can see here, we are talking about uh, some obstacles that might arise at the actual session where you try to cultivate calm abiding. And uh, the main obstacles that we have is laxity or mental thinking and mental excitation. However, here we bring into discussion also lethargy. And um, when we talk about uh, laxity and excitation we make the distinction between the gross and the subtle level for both of them all right so we begin first of all by describing lethargy because lethargy is the heaviest of those states right so the mind is uh, body and mind are quite heavy and you don't have much clarity of your focal object so this is lethargy after lethargy the next stage is mental sinking or lack City. Okay, this is divided into the gross and the subtle uh, state. In the gross state, you haven't lost the focal object yet. However, you don't have uh, an object that is clear or limpid. And the way that you hold into the object it, or the, and the way that you remember the object is very loose. So this is the gross laxity. And then for the subtle laxity, which is very tricky. You have an object that is very clear, very lucid, very limpid. You are holding it, but the tightness in the way that you hold it is slightly relaxed. Okay, so when any of those appear, uh, you have to recognize, this, uh, recognize it as an obstacle and oppose it. As we say, we have different practitioners. Some will do it just before they arrive. Some, some will do it immediately upon arriving and some will do it a short while after they have arrived. Okay, so we have men mentioned here that we might experience lethargy or we might experience laxity or mental excitation, whether in a gross or a subtle level. When they arrive, then we have to apply antidotes. So the text says, as remedy for any of this, reflect on the good qualities of the three jewels, apply the instructions on mixing energy, mind and space and imagine a bright light. So um, obviously, if you have mental uh, lethargy, it is very beneficial to uh, consider the qualities of the three jewels and also to visualize light, right? Because it, lethargy comes with this darkness, this heaviness. So visualizing something which is bright and light is very beneficial. It is also beneficial when you have uh, mental thinking. But especially for mental thinking, we have this instruction of mixing energy, mind, and space. So the way that we do this is we visualize that we have almost like a, um, a, small, bowl, uh, a small sphere at our navel, which is a mixture of our wind and mind. And we bring that upwards, the little drop, like a sphere or drop. So we bring that upwards and we bring it to the crown of the head and we visualize that it leaves from the crown of our head and that our mind and wind just uh, blends in with space. So this is the ins instruction of mixing our mind and wind with space. It helps very much if you have mental thinking. 
All right, so we have explained lethargy, we have explained laxity in two levels, the gross and the subtle, and now we're going to look at excitement. Again, at two levels, the subtle and the gross. So in our text, subtle excitement is the mental state in which the mind does not remain immovable on its object and is slightly distracted. The remedy to it is meditating with mindfulness and introspection. So we have excitement, and excitement means that the mind is not going to be calmly remaining with the object, so it's not immovable. It means there is some movement of the mind. So you are distracted. You are slightly distracted. So the remedy is to meditate with mindfulness. You need to come back with mindfulness and introspection. Okay, so then the next one is gross excitement. Gross excitement is the mental state in which, although one relies on mindfulness and introspection, the mind does not remain immovable and is distracted towards object of attachment. So now, you know, the mind has left the object and is following other more desirable, um, you know, objects. So you fancy other things. You start thinking about other things during your meditation. As a remedy, meditate on impermanence, the unfortunate rebirths, and samsaric sufferings, as well as apply the instructions on blocking excitement with coercive methods. Okay, so we can see here that when we are at the actual stage of developing calm abiding, we will encounter five obstacles, so five faults to this concentration. The first one is laziness. The second one is forgetting the advice. The third one is mental sinking and excitation. Then the fourth one is not uh, applying antidotes. And the fifth one is over applying the antidotes. To overcome these five faults, we need to employ eight antidotes. From those eight antidotes, the first four are relevant to laziness. So the first antidote for laziness is faith that comes from seeing the qualities of concentration. The second one is aspiration, wishing to obtain it, uh, having developed this faith. The third one is exertion, striving to achieve it. And the fourth one is the result of pliancy that you get through this effort. Then we come to forgetting the advice the second fault, and we say the antidote for this is actually remembering the advice. Try to remember what you're supposed to be meditating upon. For the third fault, which is mental thinking and excitation, um, what we have said is that we need to rely upon mindfulness and introspection. The actual remedies, the actual antidotes uh, are different. So, for example, if you have um, the mental sinking or the laxity, you will need to consider the good qualities of the three jewels, uh, visualize bright light or mix your mind and wind with space. If you have a subtle, um, ex if you have subtle excitement or gross excitement, what you need to do is to use the remedies of meditating on impermanence, or the suffering of the lower migration, the suffering of unfortunate of um, samsara, and to apply uh, other instructions for blocking this. All right. So this. Uh, by applying those eight remedies to the five faults, gradually you will be developed to develop the nine mental states that lead to calm abiding. Okay, so we're going to stop here for tonight. Gesha is saying he's experiencing some very heavy rain and storm over there. Okay, so we finished. Let's go into prayers. <laughs>